emergency. In case of emergency. Oh, we're connecting right now. Connecting. Thank you for dancing to in case of emergency. In case of emergency. <laughs> we are getting so many React emoji right now. Yeah. And four so already. Nice. Yeah. We have made it. We are here at the last the last day, sci-fi 2021. Mm. We did it. Yeah. Woo, we did it. Liking it. So Lighten. many good talks. Lightening it. Mm. They were, they've all been very enlightening. Yes. Ooh. Oh, wow. See, I was thinking of lichen like the fungus, which also could be in cheese. <laughs> 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 it's true. It's true that uh, it's true that many cheeses are made with with a fungus. Mm. I, I would like to just very briefly, you know, we had a lot of really uh, moving talks, including the talk from Fernando Perez this morning, which was amazing, really motivational. Mm. I'd like to give my own really motivational talk right here at the top. You know, speaking of cheese, since you brought it up, Medikin. Yeah, that wasn't Some just cheeses, at all, by the way. It was very unintentionally that I brought up cheese. Right. I, I don't know what, it's probably just off the top of your head, but. Yeah. Since, since you brought it up, I do, I do want to say, you know, we've all been thinking about cheese a lot. We're not, we're not in Austin this year. We can't be sharing queso together at Torchies, but we've been here virtually online mm. uh we've got a bad queso missing austin that was someone else's joke from the chat that i just recycled but we're glad that we're all here together right now and i know i can be a little long-winded sometimes i need to shut up but i do want to say the lightning talks everything has been really i'm trying to i'm trying to give it try, hey oh well what up? I just hey. <laughs> how how did that happen to you? I, yeah. My oh. friend, uh, my friend Colby, who's off screen and is really my friend, just stuck chips and queso into my face. Oh what? man. Well, I'm glad that Colby prepared that for you and definitely <laughs> delivered it to your house. Um, yeah. 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 Speaking of queso, we have a poll about the queso fountain. Um, you know, just in case um, some of you have some answers about this. Um, so please answer the poll. Yeah. It's good. We we start out with a a cheese bit. We have a queso poll. Some of some of your cheesiest polls, I think, so far. Yeah. Mm. Right, Julie. Right. Speaking of cheesy, also sorry, <laughs> I was also trying to pull the first speaker up to the stage. Um, we wanted to share something really quickly because I know folks have asked questions about how to present um, in Airmeet, and so we wanted to share something really quick. This is going to get kind of meta. Uh, um, so this is how you present things. So there's a little up arrow and then you can select a Chrome tab and then it'll open up your talk. And then if you hit view, it should have this bar on top. And so then everyone will be able to see it. But speaking of, we, we're hosting a cheesiest pun lightning talk giveaway. So if you would like to enter our giveaway. Use the Q&A tab in AirMeet and then enter uh, your best shot uh, of, of your cheesiest sci-fi pun. Um, and then during the lightning talks, folks can upvote the puns you like the most. And whoever has the most upvotes will get an authentic queso kit mailed to their door. So uh, this is yes. our favorite use of the Q&A tab for this. Yeah. Lovingly crafted by us, which we, yeah. we really thought about what artisanal things we could send you in this authentic queso kit. And we're definitely not punting 
the puns to you at all. Not at all. No. Um, no definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have our first speaker up, Michael, if you want to follow that Hi. amazing tutorial we just gave on air. Yeah. Um, so I get to kick off the session. Huh? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't have any content, but if one of the hosts would be willing to pin me, I'd appreciate that. Uh, yeah, there right. you go. Yeah, you're pinned, you're All pinned. Right. I will just start talking then. So I was actually going to give a talk on a different subject when I first signed up for a BOF, but I went to the Lightning Talk, or the, uh, yeah, the Lightning Talk BOF, when I was going to give a Lightning Talk, I went to the Lightning Talk BOF on Wednesday and decided there was a different topic I wanted to talk about. So if you get a chance to go to one of the BOFs, I would highly recommend you make a chance, make time for it if you can. Uh, really good experience. I'm Michael Ackerman. I'm a senior data scientist at the biotechnology company Novazymes, and we're a group of about 6,000 people who are making enzymes and microbes to improve industrial production processes around the world, whether that's making bread and cheese, very appropriate for this week's lightning talks, or laundry detergent and uh, dishwashing detergent to reduce the environmental impact of those chores, or converting starchy crops like corn into ethanol to replace the gasoline in your car. Uh, biological solutions for better lives in a growing world, as we like to say. As Dr. Burks alluded to uh, in the keynote yesterday, most of the biologists and chemists, or many of the biologists and chemists coming in to build those biological solutions don't have a lot of data programming experience or data analysis experience, if any. Uh, so my role as a data scientist in Novozymes isn't so much to do like traditional data science, as I'd call it, analysis and visualization, but to support those biologists and chemists. They're responsible for making sure their projects and their products use good data practices, and they need to make, and we need to make sure they have the tools and the training and the community to be able to achieve those goals. So as my team was looking at supporting this community of learners, we thought, you know, the yeast we could do for this budding community is provide them some kind of venue to uh, reach out to each other to understand who is passionate about this in, in Novozymes and who has expertise in this area. So we decided to steal a good idea from SciPy. So about four years ago, we adapted lightning talks into our organization, and we did change them a bit. We call them the Maker's Showcase whenever we hold them internally, generally. Uh, and everything in scope is anything you're building. So code tools, something physical, even a process in the lab or in the business to, uh, to uh, share what you're building. And you know, we figured people loaf to show off what they're doing, but you better believe people participated in this first maker showcase about four years ago. We saw uh, Python tools and our shiny dashboards. We saw laboratory assays to measure chemicals. We even saw 3D printed gadgets to tumble seeds with microbes for agricultural applications. And we saw that this worked great in the corporate context. Uh, people were leaving a breadcrumb trail of, of information to follow, to get in touch about things they were passionate about and things they knew about. And since this was internal, there was really no concern about confidentiality in the talks, which is something we had experienced around open conferences like SciPy, that was a challenge. Since it was your colleagues that were talking, following up was super easy. You just make a meeting uh, and get in touch with them to follow up on a topic that interested you that they talked about. And it was really great visibility for entry, em entry level employees and newer employees to their managers and upper managers about what they knew and what they cared about and what they loved working on. So this has really kind of become a standard practice in Novozymes. A lot of our internal conferences will now have some form of lightning talks. And um, I hope you, you all look into adapting it for your organizations as well. Uh, I do have two tips based on our experience. The first is when we first did the Maker Showcase, we, uh, we had a, a rule that we would mute people at five minutes when their time was up with no warning. We thought it'd be funny and fun. Did not go over well, I don't recommend it. So now we use a, a colored light system where the light will progress from, from green to yellow to red. This should change just a little bit uh, to indicate as their time progresses. So at four minutes, it'll turn to green, at 4.30 to yellow, at five minutes to red, so they know it's coming. In physical space, we use actual lights like this phone app or an actual like stoplight clock that we have. Uh, in virtual space, we'll change, our, we'll change our virtual background from green to yellow to red to indicate the progression of time. The other thing is that carrying the energy in Lightning Talks takes really forceful hosting, which thankfully we always have here at SciPy. Thank you for hosting that this week. Uh, so if you are going to host this in your organization, be prepared to bring that energy or find a co-host who can bring that for you would be my, my recommendation. 
I hope you will try to adapt these to your organization, whether you're in a university department or a Python user group or a Toastmasters club or in a corporation. Uh, it's a great venue, and I hope you will provide that venue for your colleagues and friends to share what they know and what they care about. Thank you. Awesome. Yay. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. It seems like a lot of seeds were planted in the uh, presentation. <laughs> a lot of cheese was planted? Yeah, you, you could say we catalyzed the data, the data culture in Ozone. <laughs> I was I was very <laughs> impressed by the puns woven throughout the talk. No, I try. <laughs> I don't I don't personally have any energy, but thankfully Julie and Madi can do so. so. I mean, yeah. now my now my brain is a little bogged down. I might you know be a little cheese sleepy, but right. that's okay. <laughs> well, you woke up and immediately thought of twenty poles, so you're you're just worn out from. It. <laughs> it's true. I uh, I used all of my all of my energy to create my my polls. Exactly. Uh, which, speaking of, we have some uh, new poll that is not punny. It's just I'm curious what of these everybody's uh, coolest unit of measurement is. So these are all real units, by the way. I didn't make any of them up. Other people might have though. So. <laughs> like Calvin guy, always making up units. <laughs> I did want to use like micro barns because the idea that a barn would be micro is it does that mean it's like a, sh a shed a backyard shed yeah it's, it's for like uh only gardening it's not like <laughs> full scale agriculture yeah so like a garden shed that's what we should call it instead of a micro barn cool Alex is up am I good to go yeah we can go that. Take it right, away. Cool. Um, I'm Alexander Billot, and I'm going to be presenting my research on optimizing transformers for quantitative data. If I can, okay, cool. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm an upcoming sophomore at the University of Texas at Austin. I have about five years worth of research experience, four of those being in molecular modeling. And recently as I was given the opportunity to work with machine learning, and that was an opportunity I absolutely took. It's been amazing. Um, and currently, I'm doing a research fellowship at the University of Texas at Austin over the summer. Um, so what is a transformer? Uh, so originally, they were outlined in 2017 in a paper called Attention is All You Need. Um, great paper. Um, it's, heavily, it's been heavily used recently in natural language processing, and more recently in images. Uh, it uses a model to explicitly get the attention out of the um, out of uh, data. Um, as opposed to other networks that do it implicitly. In fact, these models are becoming so effective that they're being seen as a national security risk. So I think I should go a bit further into how they actually work. Um, so it takes an encoder model that is able to learn what the language itself is, and then a decoder model that's able to take that language and translate it into some kind of an output. And if you want to just translate output, you just stack a bunch of the decoder models. That's what was used in GPT-3. And if you want to just learn about language, you, you just stack a bunch of encoder models. That's what's being used in BERT. So what is my project? I'm looking at this model, and I'm seeing, what can I do with this to make it better for quantitative data? It's been largely optimized for qualitative data. Um, and it sounds easy enough, very simple, but not really. Um, so what, what's wrong with the current model? They typically tokenize the data because they use quantitative data. And the attention mechanism itself is not where we would potentially like it to be. Um, so looking at the attention mechanism, it has multiple linear layers that are encoding multiple different input vectors, um, look, looking at like the keys that would you would need for a tokenized set of data, but you don't necessarily need for quantitative data. So what we're looking at doing is taking a sin single linear model to get the attention to optimize for performance Profit? I don't know. I guess we'll see. Well, no profit just yet. Currently, we're having issues with NAN loss and majority vote being relatively persistent in our research. Um, but this is ongoing work that we're working on, seeing if we're able to eventually get a model that we can use to actually get better results. Um, this is only six weeks or seven weeks into this work. so. Hopefully, we'll get 
some results at some point. Uh, my email is alex.bailout at gmail.com. If you, yeah. Um, the current GitHub, my GitHub is Alex, not Alex B, but currently the repos that I'm working on are private. At some point, hopefully, uh, we'll make those public, but we'll just have to see. Sorry for the lack of puns. I had to get through a lot of stuff really fast. No, it's fine. That was great. I, I thought your talk was transformative. Yeah. And, uh, I yeah. like how you're keeping it secret, keep it safe with all those <laughs> private uh, repos. So, so yeah, thank, thanks for coming up and tell us about the model that you're working on, Alex. Very cool work. We, yes. we hope that someday we can see your GitHub repos, but yeah. understand keeping it private right now. Yeah. Yes. And then maybe you can be a future model for other <laughs> for other lightning talks. Um, I'm noticing nobody's posting any puns in the Q and A. Please no, post them in the Q and A if you want people to update upvote them because clearly you want an authentic queso mail to you, like authentic queso kit. Yeah, get on this. Come on. But uh, th thank you, Ed Rogers, saying transformer talks always grab my attention. We got to call out. That is a good. That's a good <laughs> transformer model pun. If there was any, we got we got at least one. Yes. And, and indeed, your language was very natural. <laughs> thank, thank you to Brandon Butler. Yes. Thank you. And um, we have a really important poll. This is the most important poll we're going to post all day. So it really is, or all week, honestly. Oh yeah, all week. Yes. All year. All yes. year. Yes. Until, <laughs> until Sci-Fi 2022, where we will have the same poll <laughs> with the same answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next. The speaker is Michael, who's on stage. Um, Good afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah. Take it away. All right. So, first, can I get some thumbs up from everybody who uses a JetBrains IDE like PyCharm or Sea Lion or IntelliJ? All right, a few people. So, how many of those people also use NetCDF files? All right, maybe still some thumbs up. Okay, good. So some people might actually get some value out of my talk. Switch to share screen here. Hold on, I've got some uh, technical difficulties here. Don't worry, it's still counting against your time. So, you know. <laughs> so so the, the screen sharing, I'm trying to change to just share the screen, yes. Oh, yeah. That's it's making me go through like. Our... It really just, oh no, it. <gasps> oh. oh, do we want to? Bring up the next speaker. And then yeah, let's, let's let yeah. Denzel go ahead, and then we'll, yeah. we'll have Michael come back. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Hello. Hello. Oh, hey, um, one second. Let me just share my screen. Let's see if this works this time. Yes. Fingers crossed. <laughs> OK. Yeah. All right, can you guys see it? Yes. yes. Go for okay. it. Oh, wait, this is the wrong one. I'm sorry. One second. I'm back. I think I'm back. All right. Maybe this will work. Maybe it won't. Oh, OK. We're going to see the screen sharing again. There's OK, no then I'll just wait for Michael, I guess, and then you can go after, OK? Yeah. <laughs> what would the lightning talk be without extra chaos? Okay. Yeah, so we just sprinkled some extra chaos. Like we sprinkle um, Rotel and Queso. It's just it's a little bit of extra oh, spice. Something's happening, maybe. Ooh. It is happening. It's all happening. All right. Do you guys see a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. 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 All right. So I'm going to talk about viewing NetCDF files and PyCharm, whatever. Um, 
I'm not affiliated with JetBrains, by the way. I'm just a, a big fan. All right. So let's get this out of the way because um, everybody's going to want to see this. That's the first thing anything everybody wants to see. So, you know, everything in software, right, is scratching an itch you have. So my particular itch is I love using PyCharm and CLine. I'm forced to use NetCDF files, and I would really like a way to easily inspect uh, NetCDF files during development. So if you go to repo and you want to try this out, uh, this is very alpha. Here's the installation uh, procedure right now. Yeah, this is awful. Uh, I apologize. Basically, you've got to clone the repo, build the project using the IntelliJ IDE, uh, the free community edition is fine, and then you're going to install it via disk um, within uh, PyCharm or whatever. I'll go through a little example of that real quick. All right. So if none of this interests you, at least you're going to be able to engage in some shot and forward here with a live demo, which means I have to switch again. Do we see a pie charm now? Nope. Okay. Context. Oh, we, we, we could see it. We could see it. Oh, okay. yeah. I was Is about to say, we, we were charmed by your pie charm. Is PyCharm back? Not, no, right now it's just you. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> I really do apologize for this. There's no way to really try this out, I guess, before. No, that's why it's chaos. <laughs> and it's also more fun for me. It means I get to harass you more. All right, so now what do we see? Now we, now we see it. Now we see your PyCharm. Excellent. Charm. All right. So I have the, uh, I have the, the, Plugin installed already, which once you build it and have it on your computer, you would go to plugins, click the little gear, install plugin from disk, and then you select the zip file that IntelliJ makes for you. All right. So now let's let's make the magic happen. So you install the plugin, you get a little NetCDF tool window, you drag a NetCDF file in there, voila. So I can see my variables. So I have a time variable, site variable, air temperature, pressure. Uh, not too unusual for an SCDF file. Uh, but I'll just point out real quick the dimensions. So you see the, the two data variables have a site and a time dimension. And then we have coordinate variables, which if you're not familiar with NetCDF, a coordinate variable adds um, semantics to a dimension. A dimension itself is just an abstract. You know, index zero, one, two, three. So by convention, um, you create a coordinate variable. So a time has time values, site has site identifiers. All right. So if I select my variables of interest, note that they have to have the same dimensions. And I click over to my data tab, boom. I see my net CDF data and I can inspect it. Um, so my site and time, because those are coordinate variables as well as dimensions, the plugin pulls those in, so I can sort by if I see what all the values for a particular day. In this case, I can do that. If I just wanted to see all the values for a particular site, I can do that. And so if you're developing and you're trying to figure out what's in a NetCDF file, or you're trying to create a NetCDF file, so there's this little tool. So now, cross your fingers, we'll switch back to PowerPoint. So obviously a lot, lot still left to do with this. Um, so data viewer improvements. I want to add language support for CDL and NCML files, you know, syntax checking, things like that. And then ultimately release this through the JetBrains uh, plugin marketplace, which would greatly improve the, the experience of installation. And that's all I have. Seems like that was very coordinated. Well, once we got past the technical difficulties, yeah, mm. I didn't practice the the switching without the sh the screen sharing. So, mm. yeah, it worked out. Th thanks for thanks for demoing it, being brave enough to do a, a live demo. And it actually yeah. worked. So, yeah, it was a, a huge disappointment if if you're just here to see the crash. Well, the <laughs> meme the meme game was on point, and you perfectly segued into my next poll. Um, so we'll just go straight to this. 
tell us all. Now, we can only have six responses. Otherwise, I would have had like 100 on this poll for all of you. But you just got to have the first six that came to mind. Um, so, you know, enjoy. But I think we did see Doge in this presentation. So um, I think we know definitely what's going to be chosen by our last speaker. <laughs> OK, are you guys ready? Me? Yes. Yes. Go for it. Welcome back. Yes. Thank you for dealing with our chaos. Yeah, I understand. Okay. So, hi, my name is Jinzo Ford. I'm going to be talking to you guys about white noise reduction using style based general as of adversarial networks. Okay. So, a little bit about me. I'm a upcoming sophomore at the University of Texas. I have about a year of experience in machine learning and like. AI type of stuff. Um, I'm currently a research, a research fellow un, under the University of Texas at Austin. And let's get into the problem. So we want to do, um, we, we want to deal with white noise, which is a random variation in data. So pretty much it's like kind of like just random pictures and stuff that look kind of ugly in the image. So you can see right down here, a picture of a normal, I mean, of like a, a white noise picture and a picture of it cleaned up. So we want to try to like figure out a way to like extract this out of it. Um, so why it matters? It matters because like a lot of people, a lot of things in research are like get noisy and image and the image quality is like almost like not even readable at all. You could, later on in the talk, you could see some images that you can hardly even like parse out, which are able to get parsed out through this new method. Through this method, the reason why it's difficult to like, deal with is because white noise is random and you can't really like make an algorithm for like something that's random. So it's kind of like that kind of issue. So what our project plans to do is use a GAN. Initially, we wanted to um, make it so we can remove all types of um, all types of noise. So like you want to do like images, audio, if it's just one model, but that was kind of a bit ambitious. So we decided to, so we had the choice to, to scale it down to just a single like image, image domain only. So the game we chose was um, StyleGAN, but we realized that we can't really put an image into a StyleGAN network. So we use this thing called Pixel to Style to Pixel. Um, this is an image to image translation, like framework, more or less. Um, it, what it does is it takes an image and it puts it into a StyleGAN, a StyleGAN latent vector. And that latent vector is then interpreted into the style, into the actual StyleGAN to produce the final image. So with that, we got some pretty good results. And here's the, some final results. Um, so let me just explain to you. So the one on the left is the model that we trained with 55% noise. And the one on the right is the one that was trained with 70% noise. So as you can see, like when it's at 0% noise, it's pretty terrible because it wasn't meant to like do that. But it's kind of interesting to look at because you kind of like know what it's kind of doing under the hood, more or less. So as it gets to like the actual target noise, it looks pretty good as far as the resulting image. One interesting thing is that the 70% noise, not only does it work good at its own noise, but it also works a little bit better, a little bit good at its previous, like 55% noise. And then as the noises get out of its range too far, it just kind of falls flat and just like does stuff that's not really that makes any sense to it. So a bit of a quantitative, quantitative analysis. You can see that um, the most important important thing to look at is um the FID scores of the um 70% noise at itself it got 82 but whenever it was up to 55% noise it actually did a bit better than what it did before and compared to how 55% model got does in this it's also kind of just like a little bit worse but it's not like too too bad so possibly this could be generalizable to other other noise levels and variations the big issue is that for like small noise levels, it probably won't do very well because like this whole issue. So a few limitations. Um, once again, that um, we have the issue of spiking loss because it's just random noise. Um, we have a loss of detail and high, 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 high noise levels. So like right here, so you can see this 80% noise, but then the eyes are like, everything comes in pretty nicely, but the eyes are just like purple. And also another issue is just get hatched, which is kind of funny. Um, I'll show you those in a bit. So for future work, um, we have issues of, as far as future work, we want to use dynamic noise levels during training. So like 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 
something that's lower so we can generalize better. Um, having a having a more di different kind of data set that has more like features on it because currently we use this level A data set, but we weren't even able to finish an epoch on it because of training limitations. So it, it's really best to just limit limit the data set to be a bit smaller and um, just make it more diverse. Um, having multiple potential outputs for different noises, as well as um other uh, as well as using other image to image translation principles. So in conclusion, we we saw the efficacy of the style again using um, pixel to style to pixel, and had a bit of a trade off. Um, last slide, um, some extra results. Um, the most interesting thing is on the right side where you have the different noises being changed. Oh no! Five oh, minutes. <laughs> Oof, I finished. You got it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. We made it to we made it to the bonus results slide. So yes, you did. <laughs> that, yeah. that was really good, Dental. That's thank that you. That was amazing. Be, uh, it should be a poster yeah. submission next year, or or maybe even a proceedings. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely agree. So I definitely you. did not space out. <laughs> what kind of space did you space out? <clears throat> um, opera. I don't know if you could hear me because my singing is so amazing. In space, no one can hear you opera. Uh, <laughs> I like that you're weaving in all these jokes. Sigourney. I don't know. I can't connect her name. No, it's good. That was a great, uh, you really, you, I didn't think you were going to pull it out, but you that you made that into a reference somehow, and I'm really impressed. It doesn't sound too alien. Yeah. <laughs> um, game over, man. Game over. I, I will say I've been really excited about all of the UT folks here. They must be volunteering a lot. <laughs> oh, no, we lost David. That was too bad. Um, Okay, so we have Justin next, and then my laptop is okay. Uh, let's see. Can you guys see anything? Yep. We yeah. Can see it. Great. That's awesome. So, Justin, is aluminum a metal? Uh, yes, aluminum is a metal. It's one of the lighter metals on the periodic table. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is uh, all about aluminum extrusions. These are uh, Legos for uh, adults. They come in standard sizes. You can order them to length, and you bolt everything together and um, make anything you want with them. So um, I've been started playing with these using OpenSCAD, which is a really cool uh, text-based 3D modeling uh, program. And uh, you can do everything parametrically, which I like, but uh, for aluminum extrusions, where these things are all uh, moving in the cartinal, uh, <laughs> in the uh, ornal axes, uh, it's it gets a little bit tedious and it's hard to uh, to line things up. So I thought uh, there must be a better way, and you know maybe a, an afternoon of programming could um, improve the situation a little bit. And uh, one year later, uh, we're uh, at uh, AlexCAD and we're still pre-alpha, but uh, it's a Python program that uh, shows the uh, four views of your design, uh, the top view, the front view, the side view, and an isometric view. And uh, for full 3D rendering, it still uses OpenSCAD. So you got a bunch of alignment buttons, and you can uh, import parts and, uh, and uh, from other libraries, an ext extensible library, and also does integrated cost estimation, which I hope to demonstrate. OK, so here's a gallery. Uh, I built uh, this music stand for a friend of ours, uh, this desktop, uh, so my brother can uh, exercise inside using um, you know, a, a virtual program. Uh, I've been married uh, for 28 years, and we still have our uh, box springs and mattress on the floor. But uh, I promise to make this beautiful aluminum bed still coming. And over on the right side over here, you see uh, this is a a oxygen concentrator frame uh, that, uh, that they're building collaboratively in India. And so the frame was designed in OpenSCAD. And this is just uh, some of the work I had to do to make this work. So if you want to uh, import an STL file from another source, 
you end up with a mess. It's just a bunch of triangles in three space. And you want to convert that tri those triangles into a nice outline in a, uh, in a, you know, a simplified way. And uh, how do you do that? Well, you keep left at the fork, and you can go around and trace out the perimeter of this. So it's not the convex hull, but it is a certain type of hull. OK, so I'm going to be brave and try and do a live demo here. I've got uh, Alex CAD here and SCAD here. I've got a couple of pieces of aluminum already on there. But I'm going to add a new piece. So have our dimensions over here, 200 long by 20 by 20. I click New Alex. It shows up on the screen. And I want to line these up. And let's see, let's make it uh, the blue part on the bottom. This is like an Inkscape. And I'll make it flush left over there. Take this corner piece. And we want the blue part on the bottom. And let's see, we've got to line up with this one. Blue part on the right. And then center it in the Y. And you see in OpenSCAD, it's showing the selected part. And if you don't want to do everything manually, there's a couple of wizards. Make a cube of certain dimensions. There you go. And your bill of materials is here. Link to all the um, place where you can buy these. And the total cost is $55 of this. And if we go to click on the link, still active. And uh, going back to this, minute left. Uh, uh, finally, uh, the you know how far can you take this? I started designing a bike with it and uh, realized, oh, wow, this can really happen. So uh, just recently started riding, commuting to work on this Veloraptor. Um, so uh, that's my talk. Uh, you can find me on um, Twitter, at, at Wylam, if you want to follow along in progress. Thank you. That was extremely metal. <laughs> you stole my joke. I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. So metal, but um, yeah. I think we can all come together as a conference and agree that aluminum is a metal, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And I also would say that that definitely looks very modern. I would not say it seems prehistoric at all. Yeah. And um, yeah, we have a, a new poll. Um, I'll quick show it before we start our next one. Um, so I'm just like trying to bring, you know, do little throwbacks, speaking of old things for everybody. So um, enjoy thinking about, um, you know, not the Python 3 series. And uh, just, you know, enjoy everyone. Kyle, go for it. Hey there. So um, my name is Kyle. I work for the Aerospace Corporation. But today I'm going to be speaking as Kyle, the amateur radio operator instead. And I'm going to talk to you about SIGMF. And SIGMF is this cool thing that's the signal metadata format. And as much as you might you know, not think so, there wasn't really a great uh, open format that described how to uh, keep together radio information. And I've got a really cool demo after this part, where I just did the intro here. But most people were just keeping their stuff as flat files, and they had to rename it as, you know, test, you know, test today, you know, rev 55 with, you know, antenna three is sort of a nightmare, right? And people would use like HDF5 or maybe Pickle, but there's like things that are exclusive to Python or they don't work in every kind of format. If you know what a Midas blue file is, I feel bad for you because no one should have to work in Midas anymore. But there's formats that have been around for a long time, but there wasn't like a good one that had like an open spec. So a couple of years ago at this uh, DARPA SDR Hackfest up in the Bay Area, a bunch of engineers got together, including me, and we started talking about what would be the better way to do this. And we really form formalized it at the um, SETI Hackathon that was in Northern California, where we went up there to help them uh, think about how to apply machine learning to processing SETI recordings and look for anomalies in the signals. And at this point, it's an ongoing project. It's pretty widely adopted. You'll find a lot of data from uh, NIST and uh, SETI's hosting a bunch of data in SIGMF format. And in the defense industry, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's out there at this point. Uh, a lot of people are using it. I use it quite a bit for uh, representing like machine learning data. And I'll show you why. So uh, here's a quick example of a SIGMF file. Now, this is actually the logo for SIGMF. And it 
the logo itself is a SegMF file, but if you were to render it as like an XY oscilloscope uh, with like audio, you'd, you'd get this. So this is essentially just a two channel time series uh, file. And if we were to look at what this looks like, whoops, how do I get past this? Uh, in uh, SIGMF, here's what it is, right? So the SIG, there's a single flat file, not flat file, there's a single file that's actually a tarball that's logo.SIGMF, it's uncompressed. And inside of that, there is uh, the actual radio data that's a SIGMF.data or dash data file. And then there's a dash meta file that describes how to actually unpack that data and what kind of data it is. So here it says, okay, this thing is a int 16 with little Indian um, floats inside of it, or integers, I should say. And it's the official SIGMF logo, it's by me. And here's how I created it. Here's what the sample rate is. Here's a version that the spec refers to, all the stuff about it. More importantly, over on the right, you've got little annotations that say, hey, this part of the file between these frequencies represent this sort of information. Uh, and it's sort of, you can you can have as many of those as you want. And more importantly, you can add extensions to the SIGMF spec, so you can have, you know, your Sandia National Labs extension that adds, you know, the Sandia stuff, whatever they want to add to it. Um, here's, here's what that logo looks like in like the spectrogram sort of view. So over here on the left, this is your time series data as time is increasing down as we do in radio. Uh, land a lot of times. And then here's how the frequency is changing over time. So there's actually three annotations here. It's a bit hard to read, but you can see there's like a warm up period that's that's here. There's this spin up period where, where it sort of increases in frequency and then it spins down here at the end. Um, for uh, just features here, the main thing is you get the time annotations and frequency annotations. Uh, all the data is very portable. It's all just in the self-contained object. Uh, when you load the data, it calculates a checksum to actually verify that you've got it off the server correctly. Um, you can add your own extensions. Antenna spec, that's cool. Um, I'm an amateur radio operator. I have like an antenna on my roof that spins around. And like, I can annotate the recordings that I make that says like, okay, I, I made this recording today at noon and my antenna was pointed towards Cuba because that's where they've got this crazy antenna jamming going on right now. But tomorrow maybe I've got it pointed towards Alaska and I can actually annotate the file in real time. Here's where my antenna is pointed. So you can really do any sort of time series data with SIGMF. Uh, there's some new stuff coming in version 1.0, uh, more formalized like GeoJSON, stuff like that. Here's a file that I just happen to have on my machine already. This is like a LoRa uh, radio message. And like you can see there's a white box. This is like the boundary of like the SIGMF annotation. And we use thousands or millions of these kinds of uh, little snippets to train like machine learning models, right? Okay, I'm over time. Here's how to use it. Here's where to go. Just do pip install SIGMF. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Thank you, Guile. That was that was new to me. Get it? New you, to me. You maracaed my world. <laughs> Very cool project. Right, thanks, guys. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Now to merge all of our truest loves, we have a poll about Python and cheese. So I hope everybody loves it. You know, it would be even better than your amazing what? polls if we what? just had one kyle after another <gasps> whoa <laughs> whoa do we call that kyle kyle or kyle squared kyle section kyle plus plus <laughs> or a kyle pile oh, <laughs> hey let's keep it pg and mid even uh <laughs> <laughs> we can go from Kyle, the amateur radio astronomer, to Kyle, the former radio astronomer, next. <laughs> wow, this is, this is a very high-frequency event. <laughs> well, Enjoy the pain. You're, you're, you're riffing and you're, you're vamping is going so well that Kyle just doesn't want to interrupt. Like, you're just on a roll with the... Uh... Kyle Pie 21, 2021. Mm -hmm. can, can you, uh, are you able to share, Kyle? Okay. Take it away. Yeah, I think this works. All right. Uh, uh, do, do, do. 
Okay, can people see this? All right. Um, my name is Kyle Penner. Uh, I am a researcher at the Center for Naval Analyses, but right now I'm speaking on my own. Um, so this is going to be a uh, COVID slash technical communication talk. I live in Arlington, Virginia, and I can walk to the District of Columbia, to Washington, DC, and I have driven to Silver Spring, Maryland to get pupusas. Um, and so there are three governments involved where I live in, in my immediate proximity. And I got really annoyed when, um, when news people would talk about Virginia numbers and DC numbers and Maryland numbers. And all of the Virginia numbers included things that were, included cities that were about six hours away. And I don't really care about that because they're six hours away. But the, the numbers that are close to me in Maryland do matter. Um, on the other hand, I also got really annoyed by these really super complicated dashboards that a lot of the health departments were putting out. And in my view, in my opinion, about 80% of the ink on this dashboard is plot junk. Um, and on the other hand, I really appreciated some really well done dashboards. Um, on, on this dashboard, there are two inputs. You can fiddle with only those two things. And, and you see this, uh, this pop up and I'll sort of explain uh, what this is um, in a minute. So what I decided to do is to, to make my own. I, I just wanted some heuristics. I wanted some like, order of magnitude estimates for all of these different things. And so, so I made a thing, I made a plot uh, or a series of plots. Um, and uh, I started posting these plots on social media, on Reddit, um, because they were useful to me as heuristics and I thought they might be useful to other people as well. So at the top here, you see just, um, just a uh, number of new positive cases as a function of time. And that's for my region of Northern Virginia plus Washington DC plus the areas of Maryland that are immediately adjacent to Washington DC. Um, so those are just raw numbers. That second plot down below, uh, the, the plot be below that is reproduction number as a function of time. And if you, uh, I mean, I'm just an armchair epidemiologist, but reproduction number is something like the constancy of transmission. Um, and when that reproduction number is greater than one, the virus is spreading a lot and uh, it's spreading exponentially. Um, and when it's below one, it's uh, dying off. Um, and when I would post things to Reddit, um, there would be lots of questions. And so a lot of these questions revealed misunderstandings. Um, so people would ask like, well, the reproduction number is over 1.2, but cases are decreasing. And I would have to say that they were incorrect because cases were increasing. And so that would reveal some misunderstandings. Um, this third plot from the top, uh, was a really useful heuristic driven by that really useful dashboard I found. And that shows the, the probability of one person, at least one person um, in a gathering of 10 having the virus. And that's as a function of time. And that would reveal also a lot of misunderstanding about probability, for instance. Um, so, so a lot of people would read off the probability of 0.1 and they would think that 10% of the group of 10 people had the virus. And that's that's incorrect. It's it's the this is the probability of one or more people having the virus. Um, and so I had to go through a lot of lessons where I was explaining probability to people. Um, and this this last uh, subplot, the the plot on the bottom here is the the percentage of the, the population that has been undergone a full vaccine regimen. Um, and so this was a real simple, real simple. Um, and I got lots of comments on the simplicity and it was really uh, great, uh, nice to, to hear all that feedback. And I easily spent 10 times as much um, supporting that and uh, helping people and explaining it to people as I did actually doing the thing. 
Oh, and done. Hooray. Okay. Well, that was great. Um, thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm glad you didn't have to dash off Ward <laughs> from this talk. And thank you for the shout out for the amazing pupusas in Silver Spring. It's, it's, it's good to have a pupusa representation in the lighting talks. And we're now, I think, finally, oh, we, one more poll from the deacon. We have two more polls. There will be one after this one also. But um, just to remind everybody, there are sprints tomorrow. Um, and so, and to remind you also, uh, think about what snacks you would want to have while you're sprinting. Um, so, yeah, take it away, Robert. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Kern. Um, so like Fernando this morning, uh, on. Uh, I wanted to give uh, some of my experiences from the very first SciPy conference to today. Uh, but I uh, have chaotic energy at my heels, so I'm going to try to be brief. Now, um, I've been doing scientific computing in Python for about 22 years now. Um, if you think disutils is an old and clunky build system, you're not wrong, but I'm older than that. Uh, you probably used my work on numpy.random. Uh, according to the uh, excellent numpy user survey, uh, you all use it more than any other component of numpy, and I find that very gratifying. Um, but I'm still amused that the most significant, <laughs> my most significant and enduring contribution to science has been the uh, side project that I used to avoid doing real work in graduate school. But uh, today I want to talk about even before that, about the first uh, SciPy conference. Um, I was a baby undergrad and was able to attend because it just happened to be held on my campus and I was there over the summer. Now, there is a truism that you don't go to conferences for the talks. You go for the conversations and the hallways in between talks. This was especially true for the first few SciPy conferences uh, because Every talk was exactly the same. They followed this perfectly predictable pattern where uh, your first talk about all of the cool science that your lab does, and a surprisingly little amount of time is uh, actually spent on the details of how we used Python to do it. Um, absurdly, we felt like we had to explain why we use Python to literally the most sympathetic audience ever convened. Um, and they were all the same answers. Uh, Python syntax is easy to learn. Uh, it's interpreted, not compiled. Uh, Python is free. Um, sometimes we get specifics, like I have a bunch of C++ and Fortran, and Python's a good glue language. Um, Sometimes we'll get a personal story, like I was up late at night uh, with a deadline looming over me, and I couldn't get my MATLAB scripts to run because everybody else had the same deadline and there were no flooding licenses left. Um, the actual interesting parts of these talks were where we shared, uh, actually, how I got my boss to let me use Python, um, or the more exciting variant, how I got away with using Python without my boss finding out until it was too late for them to do anything about it. This is where we were in 2001. Um, we always had to justify uh, to our bosses, to ourselves, uh, to the scientific Python conference that it was okay to use a niche uh, language like Python um, because everyone knew that science code is written in MATLAB, and professional code is written in Java, and fast code is written in C++, and the fastest code is written in Fortran. Um, it took a few years for that template to kind of fade away, and slowly the talks became more and more about how we used Python, and more importantly, how the way we use Python can help you succeed at your science. And also somewhere along the line, uh, Python's usage exploded. So now our talks don't have to answer why Python. Uh, or if we do, as in Dr. Burks's keynote yesterday, uh, the answer is short and obvious. 
Python is everywhere. And it was that line, that difference between that line and what I remember from those first conferences is what made me give this talk. Um, so now we can ask the question, why Python, but with a different valence. It's not why do you use Python, but why Python? Why is this language in this role uh, at this time? And the key point I want you to take away is none of this was inevitable. I don't think there is anything about the Python programming language per se that made today a necessary outcome. It's not because Python syntax is pretty, it's not because it's interpreted, and it's not because it's free. At the end of the day, it is and always has been you. It's because of your hard work that built the tools that modern science runs on. The story of Python's recent dominance is the story of this community building itself to be in the right place at the right time with the right capabilities to make the most of this great sea change that has made data science the thing that we program computers for today. And so I will be eternally grateful that I've had the opportunity to contribute to that endeavor in some small way. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart that I have been able to build a tolerably long and very satisfying career without ever once having to buy MATLAB. Thank you. You got so many heart emojis for that. That was great. And you didn't get maraca either, so. <laughs> That was, I can't imagine a better way to close out our lightning talks. So thank you so much for yeah, sharing. Yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. Thank you. That was so great. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll have more one word slides moving forward <laughs> because those were great. And thank you for making us not pay for MATLAB. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Also, thank you for us for Fortran. <laughs> And also, thank you for making our the second most popular color map according to our polls. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, so we have a couple announcements as we head out. Um, first, uh, the boffs, the last set of boffs are happening. Um, they're going to be again in Gather Town. Um, however, we have added a password to gather tone instance um it's in the announcements the sci-fi announcements uh slack channel and kristen posted it a little bit earlier today so make sure to check that in order to join the gather town and also i just put it in the chat oh nice double Thank password you. the um we also this weekend have sprints coming up and if you've never sprinted before or you're new to sprints um, we highly recommend uh, one of the boffs around um, get 101 and basically had a sprint and we'll have mentored sprints as well because we want to encourage um, as many people especially newcomers to attend sprints um, and and please don't share the password to the gather town um, publicly um, because all of you have paid to come here and, uh, you know, it's for sci-fi attendees only. Yeah. But yes, we definitely, we definitely want to encourage people to participate in sprints. So please do join us over there in the BOF and help get as many people contributing and keeping this community, uh, growing and, and open and inclusive as, as best we can. So. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. This is a great sci-fi, and we'll see you around at the sprints and the rest of the box yeah. today. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.